Uh, okay, got it. Uh, welcome to the January meeting of the San Antonio chapter of the Native Plant Society of Texas. We always like to start our meeting by welcoming new members. Do we have any new members in the room tonight? Whoa, all right, a couple of them. And if anyone's a new member on Zoom, please, if you're comfortable with that, raise your hand or put your name in the comments there. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. And also thank you to any returning members. We really, really uh, value your membership. Cheryl Hamilton is going to come up uh, for our first announcement. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm here to speak briefly about one of our long-term Native Plant Society members, Judith Shockley. Uh, she passed on January 5th of this year. Many of you know her husband, Lonnie Shockley. It was always Lonnie and Judith, Judith and Lonnie. It's going to be hard for me to, to speak about Lonnie without mentioning Judith. But anyway, um, Judith was a longtime member of the Native Plant Society, both here in San Antonio and in Bernie. But more impressive than that, when they built their house in Pelotas back in 1973, they created one of the first Native plant uh, residential habitats in San Antonio. And if anybody ever had a chance to get out to their place, it was a really magical place. Uh, they had water features, they had all, all native plants of all different levels. Their, their canopy was wonderful, and they um, really lived and breathed the whole native plant concept. When I first met um, Lonnie, we were on our knees at Rancho Diana, eradicating Mandina, and he was so proud. He showed me his pants had three extra layers in the knees, and the reason for that is we're on our knees, and sometimes those knee pads can get kind of awkward. So Judith, um, as creative as she was in so many ways, had made extra layers for his knees. So the next step, of course, was for me to meet Judith. And she was a force to be reckoned with. If anybody knew Judith, she was a house of fire. And most of you know that I have a fair amount of energy. Well, she was the one that was kicking me to get things going. Let's outreach, let's do outreach here. Let's, let's bring some invasive plants to the plant sale. Let's um, get some university students involved. She did all the emails, which we now still do. We have usually 200 to 300 people on our Salty Squad email list. She and Lonnie uh, co-founded the, the Salty Squad uh, back in 2010. When we look at people like Judith, um, it inspires me to keep going, to keep the work that she has started and that so many of our legacy members have started. So um, in closing, I just wanted to share with you that Lonnie has two wonderful daughters. He's actually moving to Dallas this week on Friday uh, to be closer to his youngest daughter. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer afterward, but let's take a moment just to honor Judith Shockley. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. What an amazing woman. Okay, we had a great volunteer work day here at the Urban Ecology Center, helping to do a little bit of landscape maintenance. We had a nice group of people. It actually was pretty good weather that day. And uh, we got a lot accomplished uh, around this area, removing volunteer hackberries and other uh, trees within small tree seedlings that didn't belong within the landscape and doing some light pruning of some of the material as well. So it was a good time. And we're planning on doing it again, so be on the lookout for another volunteer work day in the future. And now Jerry Morrissey is going to come up and we are looking for anyone who's interested in getting a little bit more involved. And he's going to talk about the two opportunities we have with two different committees. All right, thank you. Uh this should be a great wildflower year. The three and a half inches of rain is starting to sprout and stuff. What really is me is I got a lot of work to do in my yard because man, every seed that's been out there is coming up. So anyhow, that means we're gonna have some great wildflower walks potentially this year. So uh, I've been leading outings, but I'm really, I really need to get other leaders involved, you know, and get them on our meetup or get them on, on our website. So we have more outings at different places around the city. 
So I'm looking for, for outings leaders. The other thing is I'm working very heavily with one of our members, Peter Hernandez and, and another Jane uh, Whedon to actually increase the number of observations on iNatric, which is a citizen science uh, website, you know, and they have what's called the Seeding Nature Challenge every late April, and we're trying to really increase our observations. So when I'm gonna be leading my outings, I'm gonna work for a little bit to start with, with iNaturalist to, to get people to learn how to use it. Because if you wanna know about anything in the natural world, iNaturalist has, ex, ha, you do photos, you put them on there, you need to do the right photos, but we have curators that are experts, you know, around the world. So if you wanna truly identify plants, insects, bugs, or something like this. Can you get in the picture? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the Zoom people can't see you. I can't. Uh, so anyhow, so I'm, uh, I've am i got a list out over there for people who would like to learn iNaturalist on one of our outings. So I've got a list for that. I've got a, 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 yeah, a sign-up sheet for any outings leaders. And I hope we, if you're not here, maybe I'll get some from the Zoom here, some outings leaders that would like to lead outings. And the other thing is the history. Uh, this uh, I'd like to do is, document the early history of the uh, of of this chapter and uh, for posterity because oftentimes we don't recognize the, all the people who started and carried on and made this possible and uh, so actually this the first just uh, just for example what I found by looking is when the native plant society was formed there were no chapters there were regional vice presidents and we had a regional vice president here, you know, and it was only in 1993 that the chapters were formed. So there's a huge amount of history there. If you're interested in history and have up as any kind of, a lot of different skills you're gonna need. You can do videos, you can do podcasts, you can you can write well. So I'm looking for people who are interested in, in, uh, in, in helping write the history of this, this group and get it on electronic so we can, see it for the future for anybody else that wants. So anyhow, uh, there's my uh, email address for any of, those, any of those committees. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. So if you want, if you're interested in either of those opportunities, JL Morrissey at AOL.com. All right, it's that time of year. You may or may not have seen the article that's out there from the Texas Butterfly Ranch but it's time to vote for our 2024 unofficial pollinator plant of the year. We've got two great annuals uh, competing this year, clammy weed on the left and partridge pea on the right. And I don't know if there's anyone that wants to speak towards either one of those. I don't want to start any fights in the room. No, they're both great. They're both amazing. There's a great article. And if you go to TexasButterflyRanch.com, you can vote. Uh, Monica, when does the voting end? <laughs> In about two weeks, is that right? 23rd? Okay, through the first week in February. So get your votes in, everybody. All right. We've got a couple of Native Landscape Certification Program classes coming up that are sponsored by the chapter. The first one is Level 1, Introduction to Native Landscapes. It's going to be held virtually on March 3rd. It's going to be the lecture component. And then the in-person plant walk will happen on April 6th. And then we'll offer the Level 3, Installation and Maintenance of Native Landscapes. It will be one full day in person at Confluence Park on April 20th, and level one is a prerequisite for that course. We do have scholarships available. We don't want the cost of these uh, classes to be prohibitive, so please reach out to us at San Antonio at nipsot.org um, if you are interested. And registration for these classes, as well as other offerings from other chapters, will open on February 1st. We have an upcoming fourth Saturday nature walk series this Saturday, actually. It's going to be Gary Poole, who is just a wealth of knowledge. And he's going to be focusing on adapting to changes in climate and uh, impacts on native plants. And that's gonna be here at the Urban Ecology, Ecology Center from nine to 11. 
And we want you to save the day, April 6th. We're going to have a plant sale benefiting this chapter at Holland Natives. So be on the lookout. We're gonna be putting out a call for volunteers who wanna help support the plant sale, but also encourage you to go to that plant sale and purchase your native plants. And also coming soon, we have been working, a group of us have been working to develop a NICE program for our chapter. And this program is a state program and NICE stands for Natives Improve and Conserve Environments. And it is a program to partner with local nurseries. So be on the lookout for uh, more information on that program. We plan to implement it soon. Our next chapter meeting is February 27th, and we're gonna have Wendy Leonard, who most of you probably already know. She's the assistant manager here based out of this park. And let me just close this so we don't see that on the screen. Um, she's the assistant manager of City of San Antonio Parks and Recreation Natural Areas. She's been working for a very long time with uh, Bracted Twist Flower projects. And there's an image of the flower. It's a really beautiful, I believe it's endangered. If it's not, in, it's yes, endangered. And so it's a really unique species. And so that should be a really interesting talk. For those folks that are on Zoom, take a picture of this QR code or go to that link, the SurveyMonkey link um, to get your SAWS Water Saver Rewards points. If you're participating in that program, You'll need to answer a few questions about the presentation tonight to get your points. I will put this up at the end of the program as well. If you are um, participating in that program and you're in the room, all you have to do is sign the form that should be somewhere in the room. It's back there. And you don't have to take the quiz. Okay, and so our speaker tonight is Cleveland Powell. And he was not able to come tonight, but he's joining us from Zoom. So this is new for us, y'all, in the room. Um, he's going to be uh, talking to us about utilizing native grasses in residential landscapes from Zoom. We did test this equipment earlier. It should work, but bear with us if we run into any challenges. Um, so excited to have Cleve here. He's one of our leading experts on not only uh, native grasses, but a lot of native plants in our areas. So it's always a treat. I'm going to stop sharing and then we'll get him sharing. And for the folks in the room, we've got some door prizes here and Haley is going to get that going. All right, we've got a couple books tonight and some seeds. So if I call your number, if you don't mind just coming to grab your prize. So last three digits, 909, get a Wildflowers of Texas book, 909. All right. <laughs> and Cleve, hold on for just a minute while we do these work prices. <laughs> Requiem for a lawnmower, 917. <laughs> All right. And then one of our members generously donated some awesome Native American seeds here. So we have antelope horns going to 888. Last week it just 888. And then showing milkweed, um, 878. 878. Okay. Prairie Ravenna, 877. 877. All right. Green milkweed is 887. Sorry, I'm just pulling up the same numbers here. <laughs> we have eight, eight, seven. Going once, going twice. How about? And we're almost done here. Y'all on Zoom. Nine, zero, seven. All right. And then the last one, smooth white instrument is going to eight, nine, five. <laughs> All right. Okay. We are done with our in-person door prizes. Thanks, Haley. Congratulations, everybody. And Cleve, I think we are, oh, let me one more reminder, um, because we're doing this sort of different here and I have to put the microphone in a weird way over here so we can try to hear Cleve. Um, if everybody could be, try to keep quiet in the room, that will help us in being able to hear him talk. So Cleve, we're ready for you to go. All right. Can, 
Is it working? It's working. Oh, sweet. Should I start my little video too? Or... You y'all want to see me, or do you just want to see my presentation? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want, Cleve. Let's uh, get the video going. All right, here we go. All right, so yeah, utilizing native grasses in residential landscapes from Cleve Powell. So you know, gardening in Texas is really uh, starting to feel like. Uh, you know, we used to be like, oh, you know, it's a normal year, normal year of rain. And then, you know, droughts came along every once in a while. Uh, but, <clears throat> you know, the past few uh, years really have some, seemed like every summer, you know, they, you know, it's either a drought all summer long or I remember back uh, maybe in 20, you know, 17 or something, they came up with a new term, like a flash drought, like a flash flood. But, you know, it's, it's this idea that like, that's the, uh, that's the, the, uh, you know, it used to be that was the event, right, that we were having uh, droughts, but I feel like, you know, more and more, uh, that's no longer a big event. So I feel like, you know, gardening in Texas, we're really gardening uh, for drought, right? Uh, and so, you know, I work with the San Antonio water system. So my idea about uh, gardening is always how to save water. Uh, and that's kind of, you know, utilizing native grasses will help with that if, uh, if done correctly. But, you know, last summer was super hot, starting this year, kind of nice you know we had that rain uh yesterday but um we're starting at a big deficit right uh, in terms of the water year uh, but hopefully we can catch up uh you know native plants will help out with that you know and what is a native plant of course uh it's you know just a plant that's native to our eco region every i'm preaching to the choir here but you can see san antonio has a bunch of different eco regions that kind of converge on bear county uh one of them is of course the Blackland Prairie. We got uh, a couple different savannas, you know, the, the post oak savanna and uh, Edwards Plateau. It's pretty much a juniper oak savanna. And then also the South Texas Plains, all of them uh, have a big component of grasses. Uh, but, uh, you know, grasses would dominate, of course, the prairies and everywhere underneath the trees and the savannas. And even the brush country of South Texas has a lot of grasses that would be native to that area. And, uh, Drought's nothing new to them, right? Uh, they've always had to deal with the, the lean times. And uh, one of the cool things about native plants is, of course, their root system. Uh, this is probably something you've all seen on, uh, on the internet or whatever, passed around on little cool posters. But you can see how, like, the native uh, prairie plants, you know, that part that we see above ground is basically just the tip of the iceberg. And they have uh, these giant root systems underground where they can, uh, you know, store nutrients and stuff and water for the for the lean times, right? And so even if they die on top, they'll definitely come back. But I want to point your uh, attention there all the way to the left. You can see that tiny little uh, scrubby kind of thing there. And that's a typical, uh, what you would call a turf grass. And you can see how short the uh, short the roots are on that. That, that one is actually uh, Kentucky bluegrass because this was all put together in uh, Nebraska where they actually have soil that's 15 feet deep right uh, but the typical turf grass they use there is Kentucky bluegrass but the thing is is the more you mow a grass the more you even a native grass the more you mow it the shorter the roots will get because you know you're putting those plants under stress and they're having to regrow their leaves all the time uh, you know, one thing to think about, especially with your turf grass, is how we treat them so much differently than pretty much any other plant in our landscape. Uh, if you think about, you know, trees, uh, shrubs, you know, you might trim them once a year, whereas grass, we're trimming constantly. And really, if they were going to live their life and, uh, you know, in a more natural uh, setting, they would grow a lot in the spring, like a tree does. Uh, they would, you know, store all those uh, sugars that they're getting over the summer and then they'd bloom in the fall and that would be their natural lifespan right but what we're doing is we're mowing them the turf grasses and they we're resetting that kind of clock so they think okay it's spring again i have to grow a lot to store those sugars and the only way that we can do that is of course putting a lot of water on them because in the summer the water stops and uh you know, uh, nature's not supplying it for them, so we have to do that for them. Uh, but if you look all the way on the right, see that cute little grass? Uh, that one's buffalo grass. And see how short it is? That's actually, it's, you know, mature height. So it can uh, stay pretty short and still produce those really deep roots. And that's because that's how it's adapted, right? It's, it's actually pretty cool that you don't have to mow it and it still stays short. But we'll get to that later. Uh, 
Oh, something happened here. Let's see. Yep. Another cool thing about grasses, of course, they're host plants for like skippers and stuff. So uh, a lot of people just think of them as kind of background plants, uh, but they can still be, uh, you know, butterfly host plants just like everybody else. Uh, but you know, a normal landscape in Texas kind of throws all that away, right? We're keeping it in that constant perpetual state of, uh, of spring. We're trying to, you know, keeping it fresh, keeping it looking good, keeping it well manicured. We have these seas of grass, uh, you know, if it's not like a weird little shrub, it's a, it's a grass. <laughs> uh, and that grass has to be green and it has to look like spring 100% of the time, right? Uh, that's a normal landscape in Texas. But, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a dichotomy. Like a lot of people think like, oh, it has to be just rocks and like one little plant here and there. Uh, or it has to be like St. Augustine, full sun, super green. Uh, and that, you know, is where kind of the idea of, uh, you know, drought gardening comes in. And I think the two main uh, tools in a drought gardener's toolbox, which all of us here in Texas should be, uh, is planting. So that means picking the right plant and putting it in the right place. Uh, you know, if you pick the, even a native plant, you can pick, uh, you know, a native plant that grows well, say in a swamp, uh, like bushy blue stems. It's a nice native grass, but if you put it out, you know, in the sun where it's not getting enough water, it might not do well. But if you put it at the bottom of your rain garden where it gets a little more water, it does a little bit better. So planting is super important, but the attitude of the gardener is also super important because, you know, plants, they're not, they don't actually use the water, right? Like that's the gardener that goes out and waters them that uses the water. And if you pick, if you do the planting right, then you can have that attitude of like, well, the plants know what they're doing. I don't have to be quite so hands-on. Uh, it's that planning and attitude of the, the planning of the gardener and the attitude of the gardener that goes together to, you know, save us a lot of water. Uh, so, you know, planning, putting my little, uh, uh, or in for saws here, you know, uh, saws has a native plant or they have a uh, coupon program. And so, you know, you pick the right plants, you do your little planning, you put them in the right place and uh, you can actually get uh, some money back from saws for doing the right thing. You have to apply ahead of time. But the cool thing about this and one of the things that we always uh, recommend is using what we call the rule of thirds. So if you remember like an, a normal Texas landscape is gonna be a hundred percent grass and or well, like 95 percent grass with like five percent shrubs so that grass you know that lawn is going to require if you want to keep it green it's going to require a lot of uh, water but if you divide it up and you know make an outdoor living space at one third flower beds which you know these plants are the plants that we're allowing to you know complete their natural life cycle we're not trying to keep them in a perpetual state of spring so they use a little bit less water than turf grasses even if you pick a, a nice uh, native grass and then of course the third of your lawn that that remains and that way you know you're cutting down by two-thirds already on that uh, desired green lawn uh and you know saws will help you out with that too so that's kind of cool uh so you know you can frame your lawn with uh those water saver plants so this is that coupon program i was telling you about you can go to gardenstylesa.com uh to to get that coupon uh but, you know, there's a whole bunch of native plants on here. Some of them are adapted, but who doesn't like an adapted plant here and there if you use them appropriately. But down here, you can see the ones that are circled are the native grasses. So you got inland sea oats and some uh, muley grasses over there. So you can, you know, you can even use this coupon uh, uh, to install native grasses. The other thing that's cool, too, is that I think at least one of the coupon vendors uh, sells uh, thunder turf so those out there who are getting their rewards points if you save up your rewards points you can spend it on uh on buying a native turf uh replacement mix so that's kind of cool so there's lots of ways to save uh with saws uh, save money and water uh and then of course there's an outdoor living rebate to help you with that other third uh, so as long as you're removing grass and replacing it with a permeable uh, patio you can get uh, a rebate. So this is after you build it, you'll get a rebate uh, for uh, however big it is. So there's a maximum to uh, 600 square feet. <clears throat> Sorry about that.
Uh, so it's, yeah, anywhere from 200 to 600 square feet. And of course, uh, no irrigation can spray back onto the patio, but nobody wants that anyway. But let's get to the cool native grasses. So this is one that we've all probably seen in uh, you know residential landscapes, commercial landscapes all over Texas. So it's actually kind of a rare plant in nature. And, you know, not around here, you know, in the hill country, it's endemic. Uh, but if you go, you know, just a little bit further east in Texas, you wouldn't find it in nature. And if you go a little bit further north, you wouldn't find it either. Uh, but, you know, it's one of the darlings of landscapers and they put it pretty much everywhere. You can see that there at the botanical gardens and it looks nice, right? It's, it's relatively uh, tame. You know, it stays in a nice little clump and you just have to trim off the leaves maybe once a year. And that, uh, Dusty blue foliage looks really nice, uh, pretty much against anything else. And it's a nice accent or you know background plant, and not much needs to be said about that because everybody loves that one. Same with gulf mealy. This one's kind of like an accent plant, right? You get a bunch of uh, other plants around it, and when it's in bloom, it looks really nice with those giant pink uh, frills. And so that one's kind of your showstopper native grass which again is kind of one of those interesting, uh, kind of rare in our parts uh, in nature, but one of the ones that the landscaping industry really loves. Uh, Gulf Muley, yeah, it's a great one. Again, it's a nice, uh, kind of shorter than the Lindheimer's Muley, but it also stays in a nice little clump. And uh, so it doesn't spread around a lot like some uh, grasses would. And then inland sea oats, this one's another one. This one does well in the shade, those other two uh, where, of course, full sun plants. But this one's a nice shade tolerant uh, native grass, which would do well to like fill in areas underneath uh, trees where you might have trouble growing other things. And most of the year it spends its time as just green leaves, but in the fall it produces these beautiful uh, kind of drooping inflorescence. And they have those big spikelets on them. So you, they uh, look like little fish on a fishing pole, you might say. Uh, but that one's another one. Those first three are ones that you see relatively often in uh, residential landscapes. And they fulfill the roles that they do uh, in those landscapes pretty well. But moving on, you know, we're getting into ones that I would like to see more in uh, residential and commercial landscapes. Uh, so big blue stem. I, there was one place in Stone Oak that had this planted. And uh, like, I was so happy I drove by it at work but then like six weeks later, they tore it all out and they put in, I think what they had originally ordered, which was like some kind of fountain grass, but don't be like them. If you can find big blue stem and you can get this online if you want it um, with live roots or with seeds, and then you could go ahead and plant it. It's pretty cool. Uh, if in drier locations, it'll stay a nice little clump and it grows pretty tall. Uh, it does require a little bit more moisture than some of the other uh, native grasses we've talked about so far to get really big, but it'll it'll kind of survive uh, drier locations as well. If you give it a little bit of shade, it can survive more in the drier locations, especially that uh, afternoon sun can really bake it, but it's one of the biggest, tallest uh, native grasses, and it would have been uh, really big in the Blackland Prairie, uh, you know, back in the day. But again, it's a cool grass. Doesn't really get as blue as some of the other grasses that we have on this list, uh, but it still is an eye catcher uh, when you have it. Little blue stem. Uh, yeah, this one is probably would have been one of the dominant grasses in the San Antonio region of both the Blackland Prairies, the the Hill Country, and uh, you know especially the uh, the savanna, the post oak savanna would have been full of this, and still is actually. When you get down, you know, in this, the Sandy Oaks area almost all the grass that's growing out in the fields is a uh, little blue stem, which is really cool to see. But it's a, uh, again, it's a very, it's a clump forming grass and stays very uh, compact and it won't move around a lot on you. If you plant them by themselves, they, too didn't, they do tend to get kind of tall and then fall over. So if you plant them in with other things, uh, they stay a little bit more compact or uh, to keep them from falling over, you can trim them uh, maybe like at the end of June and uh, then they have to regrow and they won't get so big uh, as if you just let them do their own thing throughout the growing season. But, you know, they sometimes if you get an individual that turns blue, that's nice. Sometimes they stay green all year long. 
but as the fall turns into winter, they turn this kind of rusty uh, red color. Mine didn't do it this year until January when we got that first little freeze. Uh, actually, that big freeze. And that's when it got really uh, orange, like you see here on the right. But again, it's another cool plant. And it can complement uh, all sorts of native uh you know, wildflowers and things like that that you have in the background. Uh, you know, little blue stem just hanging out there. And it while those plants are kind of going dormant, you know, for the uh, winter, little blue stem, or really any of these grasses will stay, uh, you know, will persist. And, you know, this one has a very good uh, winter color because it turns that bright orange copper. So when all the other plants are kind of dormant, little blue stem can shine through uh, in the winter. Switchgrass, uh, this would be a really big grass to put in a residential landscape. So basically only if you really have a space that you just want to fill up. It, it's, you know, tall, the very tall, uh, full sun plant again, but it gets, uh, at least the kind that grows around here, get to really big clumps and they can get, you know, uh, eight feet tall or more. And uh, that's one at the Botanic Gardens. You can see how big it can get. Uh, it's got really cool leaves though. There are varieties that they sell. I remember I, I've seen some, they're kind of harder to get. You have to get them at nurseries, but they'll, there's ones that stay smaller. There are ones that are sterile, so they won't spread by seed. And those are maybe a little bit better to use in uh, landscapes if you want to control them more. But like this one's just a wild type seed that's going, going crazy. <laughs> uh, but the cool thing about all these grasses is that they have their place. Uh, yellow Indian grass is one that I think really could have a lot of uh, use in residential landscapes, because not only does it have the beautiful blue leaves, and it has these really nice uh, yellow inflorescence in the in the winter, or sorry, in the fall, and that contrast between the uh, the blue and the yellow look really nice. And some of these ones, like the yellow Indian grass or maybe the uh, switchgrass, I think would be cool to put in with uh, tall wildflowers. You know, like ones that you would typically think would be like bullies in your garden like uh, western ironweed or something and when you put you know maybe an aggressive big grass like yellow indian grass and match it with a uh, uh, like a typical garden bully like uh, uh, western ironweed or maybe american germander they can kind of fight each other and so that that way you have that uh, kind of more of a natural look if you like that uh, but you know they will uh, kind of intermix, and you'll have you know the big purple flowers coming up through these blue leaves, or with the American germander, you know the white, uh, the beautiful white flowers coming up through the blue leaves. I think would look really nice, and you see that happen, you know, in uh, in nature when you're walking around. So if you want to kind of mimic that kind of thing, uh, Sinus grandma, of course, it's a beautiful uh, short to mid-sized grass, medium height. It would not quite a uh, not quite a, a, a turf grass that you'd put in your lawn, but it's nice to have around in a wildflower meadow or something. Oh, pardon me. Uh, where, you know, things are getting a little bit more wild. Or, or you know, if you want to have one just as a specimen in your garden to be like, that's the state grass. Uh, I included the picture here on the right because it's uh, actually surviving in a mown area. So it can actually get mowed from time to time. And it like these little clumps have all spread out to almost be like a sod, but it's, this area is very infrequently mowed and it's done with like those really big uh, tractor mowers. So it doesn't get very short, but you know, just that once or twice a year mowing with those big tractors has turned that little patch of grass into a little, or a uh, side oats grandma turf, which is, I, I think is really cool. So if you were into that and you could like mow it at a, maybe like, you know, six inches height you know you can get yourself almost like a little turf grass or you could throw it in mix it in with uh, some of your other grasses that you use for your turf uh meadow sedge is another oh let's get that there we go <laughs> uh meadow sedge is another turf um well it's it's a grass adjacent plant let's say it's in a different plant family it's in the sedge family all the other plants we've talked about so far are in the grass family but meadow sedge, as the name implies, is a sedge. It's evergreen, and it does best in the shade, uh, to part shade. Uh, and I have some that grows in the sun, but it tends to completely brown out in the summer, uh, and then it comes back in the winter. 
it does most it's a very slow grower it does most of its growing in the cool season and so you know as summer wears on they can start to show uh show a little bit of wear and tear if they don't get a little supplemental water by you or if they're not in deep shade uh, but it's a cool thing a lot of uh, turf grasses won't do well underneath live oaks for example but a lot of sedges uh will do just fine there so you can kind of fill in those areas that are hard to grow things in with a beautiful little sedge and you can see it's not really a turf they always stay in little clumps but uh, they can kind of fill in and almost be like a pseudo turf kind of thing but then we get to the, the cool ones the native uh, sod forming grasses and they're typically sold together in like a bundle of seeds uh, have a turf or uh, um, thunder turf or couple brand names but we got curly mesquite we got buffalo grass and blue grandma and all of these can kind of coexist and co-mingle uh and then when you mow them not very often uh they you know they never get tall enough blue grandma is the tallest one and if you weren't going to mow it it would get you know maybe 18 inches tall but if you just did buffalo grass no matter how long you left the mowing it would never get taller than you know maybe six inches or so uh so it's one that's really uh you know, if you have spaces that are full sun that you want to convert uh, from regular turf to uh, native turf, you can do that uh, for sure. Using one these three or any one of the three or just a mix of two. Uh, so I, we're going to move into a little, uh, um, what do they call, uh, case studies. Uh, so step one is, of course, to prepare your landscape, make the plans, uh, decide what you're going to do. This is my uh, one of my coworkers' homes that he completely redid his front yard. Uh, and his first little plant there was a, a sage plant that he was very happy about. So he took a picture of that. Uh, but, you know, then he set out all of his plants. Uh, and then, you know, after a lot of digging, a lot of spreading of mulch, you know, it started to come together, started looking like something was happening. But you can see he's framed his grass there in the middle. Uh, you know, treating it like the precious thing that it is in a, in a drought hardy landscape. Uh, and he's got the flowers around on the outside, which will be, uh, you know, a little bit more resistant to the, to the lack of rain. Uh, he dug up his front yard and then he uh, used, uh, I think he used thunder turf seeds and he just spread them around and watered them in like they uh, tell you to, you know, it's, the hardest thing about this is, of course, getting the ground ready. Uh, you know, there's different ways to do it. You can solarize it, which can work if you're. But and all all the all the ways that you have to do this, you have to be like super diligent about. You know, you can't just like halfway uh, solarize something, or you know, if you decide to go the chemical route, if you only do one or two applications of herbicide, that's probably not going to kill your Bermuda grass. Uh, or if you do, like if you smother it with uh, uh, cardboard and mulch, you know, any of these uh, three ways to do it can work, but it just requires you, like the more work you put in up front, the more success you'll have afterwards. Because if you do it halfway uh, and those seeds are coming back, or maybe there's a stolon or something that's coming back from that Bermuda grass, it can quickly overwhelm the little seedlings uh, from your from your native turf mix. So I'd I can't stress it enough, the preparation uh, is the hardest part, but the more preparation you can do, the more success you'll have, which, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Uh, but uh, the, after you seed, the, some of the most important things to do after seeding is preventing the weeds. If you, uh, if you seed in the fall, you're probably gonna get a bunch of rescue grass, which is that green grass that's green outside right now. Uh, it's a winter weed, it's an annual grass from uh, Europe, Eurasia, but it, those seeds are so ubiquitous that like, you know, you, you turn over a pot and they're going to start growing in the fall, right? Uh, they're everywhere. And if you don't, uh, get them quick, uh, then they'll quickly outgrow your native grass seeds and they'll smother them and, you know, use up all the water and stuff. So the best way to avoid rescue grass I've found is to plant in the spring. So basically late enough in the year that when you water in your seeds, the rescue grass won't sprout. Uh, so that's like May, uh, June timeframe. It does mean that you're gonna have to help your grass get through the first summer a little bit more, but it saves you a lot of uh, weeding. 
Purple nut sedge, uh, that's a, another uh, introduced sedge species. And that's, uh, you know, it's growing in pretty much everybody's yard. Uh, but if you can learn to identify it and pull it out uh, before it gets a hold, uh, you can have a lot more success with your native turf grasses. And of course, Bermuda grass, learn to ID that because otherwise it'll, it'll take over. And unlike uh, our native grasses, it does really well when you mow it frequently. And so if you see it and then you want to mow it, then it, so it'll start out competing some of the native grasses and then you'll have to mow it more because it gets taller. And so it starts this kind of downward spiral. So if you can keep it out at the beginning, then you can do uh, a lot better. Uh, uh, you can yeah keep it going a lot better in the future. So the maintenance, you know, nothing is uh, maintenance free. There's always going to be uh, some maintenance with even native plants, of course. Uh, so you want to do infrequent mowing. And that, you know, what does that mean? Basically, if you mow it two times a year, it will probably be okay. You want to mow it uh, maybe once right before it starts growing in the spring to kind of clear off any dead uh, leaf litter or, you know, nest leaf litter from the winter and start it uh, afresh in the spring. And then maybe mow it once. Uh, you know, maybe at the middle of the summer or towards the end of the summer, depending on how, uh, you know, the, the, the summer is going. If it's a really hot and dry summer, you probably won't have to mow it until the, kind of the end. Uh, but if we're getting a, like one of those random summers where we get rain every two weeks, you might mow it, you know, halfway through. Uh, of course, there's no need to fertilize, especially if you let the leaves uh, mulch. And then you would want to water it once a month in the absence of rainfall. Uh, and that that's just to keep it healthy. If you don't water it, it won't necessarily die, but uh, it's not going to be as healthy as it would be if you water it a little bit. You know, there's some, even, even with plants that you water throughout the year, right, there's some natural selection that has to occur during a drought like the one we just had. Uh, so if you weren't going to water, you know, you would definitely see it in the spring when this grass is trying to come back. It would, it would not be as uh, vigorous as it was going into the drought. But if you water it once a month, it should retain that vigor a little bit better. Uh, so yeah, definitely there's some maintenance, not necessarily water free, uh, but uh, here's another kind of little example uh, where uh, Brad decided to uh, add in some uh, sedges to his little native grass patch. And it's native grass is on either side, but uh, as his trees were growing up and starting to shade, he thought he might add in some uh, sedges to kind of supplement his turf. Uh, and you can see him kind of growing in. This is the first spring, you can't really tell. You can kind of see the little clumps where the sedges are, but everything looks happy. Uh, here it is uh, just after planting. And you can see the, the sedges a little bit better there. But here's another example. And this one has to do with just, uh, this one's just buffalo grass and blue grama. You can see the blue grama on the left is much more dominant where it's taller. And then the, the buffalo grass is where it is a little bit shorter. And then on the right, it's mostly buffalo grass and a little bit of uh, uh, blue grama. And you can see it's not, it doesn't look like that that lawn, you know, the dichotomy lawn that we had from at the very beginning, right? It's not perfect, it's not lush, it's not green, but it is in its own way, lush and green. Uh, you can see a little bit of dead leaves in there and that's normal. Some people that freaks them out, but uh, those are just leaves that the plant has cast off, right? That's normal uh, growth. Uh, but so if you're looking for that, that emerald green Ireland look, of course, there's only one way to get it. <laughs> and, uh, honestly, there's an entire industry out there of mow, blow, and go that you'll have to go for. But to save water, you can go with this. Uh, and uh, it looks nice, I think. Uh, so here's a couple little uh, examples of what it looks like after the drought of last year. So both these pictures were taken uh, at around August uh, 2023. And you can see uh, Brad's little section there the sedges are kind of holding on. A lot of the grass has gone dormant. Uh, and then on the right, you know, the grass hasn't gone completely dormant. It's gotten shaggy and started to lay down. This is mainly the area where it's just blue grandma. So it's a little bit taller than the buffalo grass would be. 
but you can see how it's just kind of leaning. Uh, and this is where we get into what you can do to kind of freshen it up when it starts to look like that during a drought. So this is the time of year when it starts to look like that on the right, where you just go through and you'd mow it. And this is just clearing off a little bit of that uh, thatch that's built up, you know, from a couple springs worth of growth. Uh, this person uh, mowed it, you know, and you mow it tall and then you give it a little watering. That's why that, that if you look on the right where that little uh, hose is going across there, uh, they watered it. And then after, you know, a week, it was already starting to green back up again. So, you know, this was, they kind of like gave a little shot in the arm at the end of last uh, summer. But if you, if you compare that to like a normal lawn where you'd be watering it every week uh, in a vain attempt to keep it uh, green, as opposed to this, where they, they literally let it go all summer long, they cut it, and then they watered it once. Uh, you know, it's, it's obviously not the exact same. <laughs> but it is uh, pretty nice. I, in my opinion, you know, it's aesthetics, right? And in my opinion, this is more beautiful than a, a you know, cookie cutter lawn. Uh, and this is after, you know, a couple weeks later, it rained, like randomly, <laughs> it rained a couple times th this last fall. And then the plants were greening back up and, and flowering again, uh, which is kind of cool. So they really respond well, uh, especially when you give them a little rain over, or if you give them a little water over the summer, uh, they really oh. respond well when the temperatures drop and we get rain. Uh, and that's, you know, that's what they're used to, right? That's what they're adapted to. Part of their adaptation of getting through drought is going dormant. And as long as uh, our attitude is such that we can look at brownish grass, uh, then that uh, we can save a lot of water that way. So here's a couple before and after pictures. That was Brad's house here. It's, you know, normal Texas landscape on the left, thriving uh, wildscape here on the right. Uh, with You kind of have to look over uh, to see the, the little native lawn in the middle there. But, uh, you know, it's going, going great. Uh, and then, you know, before and after, we got a little full sun here, you know, typical Texas landscape again, little shrubs, a random uh, tree, and a bunch of lawn. And then over you know several years, uh, the landscape has been completely transformed into uh, you know beautiful uh, Texas uh, native landscape. And again, you kind of have to look over. Both these people decided to put the native grasses uh, where they could see them. <laughs> you know, so that one is up there by where the swing is. You can kind of see that little uh, blue grandma patch right there. But again, you know, this is going to take a lot of work. But it's a good investment, right? Because, uh, you know, if we're getting uh, any investment, of course, is, or any amount of work. Well, uh, what am I trying to say? Oh, any kind of landscaping is going to take a lot of work. But you might as well take uh, that work and put it into an investment like this on the right, where it's going to be, you know, it's going to pay back. Uh, whereas if you just keep on mowing and watering and mowing, you know, what, what what's, uh, what's going down there? You know, it's kind of crazy there. Other benefits of having a native uh, grass lawn is that it's a lot easier to put uh, other plants in, you know, nestle them in there. So on the left here, uh, my friend with the buffalo grass lawn, I've given her some uh, zizotes and she's got them growing. And so now her lawn is technically, not only is it providing for skippers, but monarchs could come there if they wanted to, but also wildflowers, you know, you can throw a little wildflower mix in there, uh, put some seeds out. And, uh, you know, as long as you're happy with them growing and not mowing them, <laughs> it, it will, they'll coexist well with a, uh, with a native grass lawn. Whereas like if you have that typical normal lawn, it would look kind of weird, I think. Uh, plus you might have a lot of rescue grass coming up through the wildflowers and things like that. Uh, but other things you could put in the native turf grass would be, of course, you could like stash some uh, uh, swan flowers in there or uh, anything that's of course kind of short or mid height, you know, just pick the flower uh, that you want to put in and then match it to the height of the grass. You know, before I was talking about how you could put Western ironweed and uh, Indian grass together. So those are two tall plants, right? Where you could get a, like a little blue stem and something maybe a little bit shorter, like a uh, uh, liatris or something like that, gay feather. And you could put, you know, match those plants together and kind of do like a, uh, a thing like this. So this was just a thought that I've had. This is kind of the way I garden. But you know, you have wild blue larkspur that blooms in the spring. It's a you know, it's a beautiful plant, 
and you might want to put it in your garden, but it's really only above ground for, uh, you know, maybe like four months of the year. It comes up as like a weird little uh, winter rosette. It blooms and then it completely goes away. It's a perennial. So it's not like you can like put something else in there. Uh, but it, it's not like a, it's in a showstopper when it's, when it's blooming, but it would leave a gap in your uh, landscaping if you just, you know, had it like a traditional, like, oh, this is one plant here and one plant there. But imagine if you planted a little blue stem in there. And then on the left, you plant the wild blue larkspur. And the Texas skeleton plant, this is another kind of cool plant. It, it blooms in the summer, but its leaves, it's, you know, it's not a very substantial plant, let's say. It's called a skeleton plant because it's just got little stems and it looks like just like bones, right? And in the spring, it would just be a little rosette of leaves. And then in the summer, it could grow up around the little blue stem and be blooming. And then the, when it starts to wane in the fall, the gay feather, which has just been like a weird little green stem all year, uh, would start to bloom. And so you can kind of work this way around. And so imagine like a little blue stem in the middle of this, you know, while these other things are having their time, the little blue stem is just slowly growing all year long. And when they're dormant uh, during the winter, the little blue stem can be there as kind of like the, like the linchpin that kind of holds everything together. Uh, so it kind of unlocks these uh, native wildflowers that are lesser used in landscaping because they have, oh, not necessarily a drawback, but you know they have these times of the year when they're just not doing anything. Whereas like, if you could kind of do like a square foot gardening, native garden kind of thing, where you're just putting all these plants that will cohabitate together and not uh, step on anybody's toes, it, like kind of like niche partitioning, right? So like, you know, you got spring interest, summer interest, fall interest, and the winter int interest from the grass, you can get these uh, kind of rare plants that aren't really used in landscapes and get them going in your own uh, personal landscape, which I think is really cool. And that's, you know, what native grasses, and if you were to use native grasses, that's, a, you know, a lesser used native plant, but then they can even unlock further lesser used plants. And then of course, the biggest benefit is more prairie, right? Uh, almost all the prairie has been, uh, developed in one way or the other. And so if you can make your own nice little pocket prairie in whatever way that you can, you know, you're doing your part for little grassland birds that don't have a lot of place to hang out. And then of course there's other ground covers that you can use. And you can use these by themselves in conjunction with each other or in conjunction with uh, the native grasses. But I always like to throw them out there because a lot of them can be uh, overlooked too. And especially the tube tongue up there, Greg's tube tongue is a plant that I think we should get more, I would like to see more of uh, growing in people's gardens because it's awesome. Last summer it was blooming all summer long uh, in the shade. And even in the sun, it doesn't, didn't really dry up too bad. And that was without without any, you know, any rain at all, practically. Awesome little plant. But now, you know, again, with the attitude, if this is a, a yard in my uh, neighborhood, and on the left, you can see at the beginning of uh, the summer of 2022, it didn't get watered all year long. Uh, and this was it at the end of 2022. So this, I like to say this is the most drought tolerant uh, landscape <laughs> in all of San Antonio. And it's only because the uh, the gardener doesn't water. They, 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 they're fine with it. They just mow it every once in a while. And because they're only mowing it when it's long, they don't, like a lot of times people just mow and mow and mow. And you start to get like that kind of crust of soil and it's a downward spiral and things look really bad when you don't water. But if you only mow when you need it, uh, you know, it doesn't look so bad. It doesn't grow because there's no water and you just kind of let it do its own thing. But the real reason why I picked this one is because you can actually see all three, or you can see three of the are the typical turf grasses in San Antonio. And it's a little bit easier to see on the right hand, but you see that green section over there kind of towards the left hand side. Is there a pointer? Yeah. So over here, we've got uh, St. Augustine in the shade of the house. Out towards the street, we have uh, Bermuda grass. And then here, where it's taller, so this would kind of correspond to this section, that's all buffalo grass. And it's just these three grasses kind of, you know, they exist together uh, with each other in this person's lawn. You know, they're not doing anything about it. Uh, they just mow it. And it's kind of cool to see them all coexisting and they all look pretty okay even after the summer uh of uh you know 2022 and dogs love it <laughs> dogs love prairie so are there are there any questions 
leave. Uh, we have a couple of questions that were in the chat and we just realized we didn't really think about how we were gonna do questions in the room. So we're gonna test a separate mic real quick for anyone in the room. But from the chat, um, somebody was asking if many of the plants that you were highlighting can be found in either small pots or from seed. Yeah, all, all of them can be found by seed. Uh... And then uh, other of the, well, not, well, not the meadow sedge, but the meadow sedge is pretty, uh, if you go to like a native plant grower, they should have it. It's sold sometimes under the name Weberville sedge, I think. It should be Carex pertentata, uh, if you can find that on the label. There's another one, uh, cedar sedge, which is harder to find. Uh, but those, those ones you can find in nurseries. All the other plants you can find by seed. A few of them uh, can be bought from live roots. And I've seen a uh, little blue stem at uh, Lowe's one year. That was that was cool. So if if you keep your eyes open and look for them, you can find them from at, at nurseries too. Do we have any questions in the room? I'm just going to have to repeat them because our other microphone does not work. Any questions for Clee? Yes, Clee. What kind of grass is this adorable dog laying on? <laughs> so that is laying on blue grandma. Okay, we have a, another question. I'm going to repeat it. Viewers just selections or recommendations of what you recommend. So, uh, deer resistance. We've got someone that has some deer and is wondering which of these are deer resistant. So, yeah, the good thing about grass is that uh, they're just really uh, nutrient poor. So for example, if, if like a deer were to eat too much grass, they would actually starve to death, just like we would. Uh, so it takes like a cow or something to be able to eat grass in a quantity to, to really hurt it. Uh, so yeah, all grasses are pretty much uh, deer resistant. They, you know, deer can lay on them and kill them, uh, but, but they won't, they won't uh, necessarily eat them to death like they will with some other plants. And if they walk on them, yeah, they can make the little game trails through your yard too, but. Okay, thanks. Any other, we've got a question over here. Hold on. I have a question about cultivars. You see them more lately. I've seen some of them kind of, then kind of newly for sale. And the spikes are just really just huge and just real exaggerated. There's a trunk cap and the flowers are real big. Uh, they're beautiful. There's a, you know, there's uh, a golf community, it's like it's a target in the parking lot, but it's really just huge little things compared to what you see going on in the Do those still have the same uh, hosting ability for the host animals? Do you lose anything by choosing to use these fancy cultivars? No, the same species, does it? Okay, so Cleve, the question is about cultivars and is uh, wondering if you lose anything by going with cultivars versus wild types. And um, he mentioned that he's seeing some examples of like Turk's cap with really giant flowers and um, big muley with really giant flowering stalks. And just wondering uh, if you can speak a little bit to that. Yeah, uh, so yeah, well clearly, so if, hmm. uh, you know, you, you yeah, let's think. So it's <laughs> cultivars, and yeah, so I think, well, one of the thoughts that came to my mind when you talk about uh, Lindheimer's mule, there are a bunch of different muley grasses, so it might be that they have mislabeled, uh, like Lindheimer, maybe they put bull muley in and, and called it Lindheimer's, but when you start, you know, selecting different plants for different traits, right, you are messing, you're, you're taking their genetics and, and selecting them for different things, so maybe a bigger, maybe if they're putting more energy into a in fluorescence, they might be less uh, hardy, but it would have it would have to be on a plant by plant basis. You know, you might notice uh, you'd have to, yeah, you know, try them out if you if you're interested in trying them out. You could try them out and test them out uh, and see how they do. But a lot of times, people will say that different cultivars are less uh, less hardy than their than their wild types, and you know that makes kind of logical sense, but I don't have any like data to, to back that up. So 
Thank you. Okay, so we have a couple of questions about Weberville Sedge that have come in on the Zoom chat. And one question is, uh, do you know where someone could find Weberville Sedge? Yeah, I think uh, you should, well, first and foremost, look at uh, some of our native plant growers here in San Antonio, or the native plant nurseries in San Antonio. But if you have to, uh, I, I think they sell it at the, no, that's a, yeah, I would first check there. Um, I think if you buy it at the Lady Bird Johnson place, uh, when they have their plant sales, they generally have a selection. Uh, places in Austin, you can probably uh, look online. If you wanted to buy like in bulk to do an entire front yard or something, you might have to, to look online to find someone who's selling it uh, in like little four inch pots where you can buy tons of them at once. Great, thank you. And again, that one's sometimes called Meadow Sedge or Weberville Sedge. And then the other question that came in on Zoom was what is the difference between the Weberville Sedge and Berkeley Sedge? Yeah, so those are two different species. Uh, the Berkeley Sedge is, I don't exactly know where it's from, but it is not a native plant to Texas. Or, and I don't even think it's a native plant to uh, uh, North America. So you'd have to do some research in the Berkeley Sedge. Uh, in, it, it's probably more, it's probably easier to find unfortunately, uh, you know, just because <laughs> that, it, that's, that's the way they do. Uh, but it gets bigger. It's, it's, a, it's a larger plant, even more clumping than uh, uh, meadow sedge. So it, it would be a little less like turf already, you know, even more less like turf than, than uh, meadow sedge or Weberville sedge. Okay, we have another question that just came in. I saw in the chat about uh, good suggestions for native plants that give privacy from neighbors. <laughs> Oh yeah, well, so like I guess over the top of a fence or something, you'd want to get something tall and evergreen. Uh, which uh, let's see, uh, I'm I'm blanking on that. Maybe you'd like something like a mountain laurel or uh, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> but that's a little outside. Also, is a good one. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. Unfortunately, there aren't any of the native grasses that. We'll stay big <laughs> and private and make, make privacy. Yeah, we're getting out of the, the range of the grasses and the forbs for the, the privacy question. Um, any other questions in the room? Looks like we're, oh wait, there's one back here. Hold on. How difficult are the grasses to grow from seed? Um, she's wondering about some of these larger grasses. Are they hard to grow from seed or maybe how long might it take them to get uh, full size? Yeah, 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 that's a good question. Uh, it'll take maybe a couple of growing seasons. So if you, if you start them in the spring, that's a fine time to start them the spring. Uh, they won't get full sized uh, by this fall, but they will get big enough to, probably to bloom uh, and do bit they might be like a quarter the size that they would be after the second year of growth they'll get maybe four times as big and then that's pretty much full sized uh so yeah maybe a couple couple growing seasons to get them full sized thank you so there was a question that came in about um sugar plume grass i've never heard of that have you heard of sugar plume grass uh so i think they're they might be talking about some of the uh there's some there's some plume grasses that grow in East Texas uh, that just got renamed. It used, they used to be part of saccharum, the genus saccharum, which is the same as sugar cane. But those are generally a little bit more, like we we're talking about native plants aren't always drought tolerant, right? Because those are from East Texas. They like to grow in wet soils. So bringing them out west, out here, they might become a little more uh, finicky where you're having to give them a lot more water. Uh, than you would maybe want from a native plant. Thank you. And we did have a question here. Yeah, uh, Wendell, if you could give uh, some thoughts about <clears throat> ground cover versus mulch. When to use the. Did you hear that question? And when to use ground cover versus mulch? So I'm I'm a little crazy. Well, so if you want to make it look more formal, 
uh, mulch is probably the way to go. Uh, you know, that's something that people understand. You know, there are plants and there's mulch and, and you know, plants don't touch. A lot of times, though, I like the more wildscape look where you do start to see plants come together. Uh, in, in my own landscape, I don't, I, I don't really use mulch because I fill in with other plants. Because, you know, the good thing about mulch is that it reduces the soil temperature and it keeps down weeds. Then you can do that same uh, action by just planting plants everywhere. <laughs> so that would be what the ground cover would be. So if you wanted to like fill in large bases, and if you do something like uh, uh, Greg's tube tongue, you know, it's I I think it would look nicer than than a bunch of mulch. But you know, it's got those nice little purple flowers everywhere. Uh, so it's it's really depending on what the uh, goal of the landscape is, though. You know, in areas that are a little bit more forward facing you might want to do like plants and mulch uh, but in areas where you can make it a little more wild uh, go for those ground covers go go for like uh, you know like a native turf mix and you can have like a little wildflower meadow or something like that thank you any more questions in the room looks like we're out of questions in the room there was one other question and i held off on it because they were mentioning the houston area and um, they were wondering about recommendations for plants in riparian areas, but like I said, they mentioned the Houston area. Oh, and so Houston area riparian plants? <laughs> uh, there's ravens. <laughs> Maybe, but I know, so it's a little out of We're in San Antonio chapter. We're <coughs> in Houston. We do have riparian areas here. Um, I don't know if you can speak to that or if you would just like to speak to what you know about recommendations for riparian plants. Yeah. Yeah, so, I, well, there are some plants that go, you know, both places. So, uh, Eastern Gamma Grass is a is an awesome riparian plant. Uh, with the rough leaf dogwood uh, is cool. Uh, if, you know, uh, the false indigo bush, Amorpha fructicosa, that one's awesome. And those are all bushes that will grow. Uh, black willow, you know, if you're, if you're looking for just like something to stabilize banks, black willow, mm -hmm. cottonwood, things like that's awesome. Uh, but Ravenfoot sedge, there's a sedge for you, uh, and switchgrass, of course, is awesome on the on the toe. Thank you so much. Those were awesome answers. Um, <laughs> all right, well, please, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. Those your images were awesome. Please don't forget to go yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Always great to hear from you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Excellent. Do you want me to stop sharing here? Yes, if you don't mind. And I'm going to pull that SAWS QR code up for the folks on Zoom to see again. Thanks again, Cleve. That was really awesome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> Okay, folks on Zoom, there's the QR code for you. And for the folks in the room, we've got a few plants in the back for plants by donation. And do we want to turn the camera around so everybody can say bye? Well, no, that no. I'm sharing it, right? Y'all can see the QR code on the Zoom? Yeah. No, just the camera. Can I get a picture of everyone since everyone's looking this way? <laughs> <laughs> Native plants. One, two, three. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I can't see the view to see. Uh, I took off the uh, show the video. I don't know. We don't know if you can see or not. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.